Thanks for being here. I hope you're as awake as I am. Uh, I'm still jet lagged. Uh, my name is Dwayne Smith. Uh, my partner Stefan and I, you probably saw us, la if you were here last night, you saw us last night. Um, uh, I'm talking today about the good, the bad, and the ugly work of machines. Uh, I think it's a nice way to start off this, uh, today's sessions uh, to establish a little bit of subjectivity maybe in uh, human machine interaction. Because um, all design is good design, right? Right? All design is good design? No, no. There is bad design, there's ugly design. Uh, I think we all think of it uh, a little subjectively at times, right? Uh, so I, I think there's a, there can be a correlation between what is good and bad and ugly and also how machines are used in the design process. So actually what I'm going to be talking about today is really what, uh, how machines can actually affect good, bad, and, and ugly design, okay? So uh, actually, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I mentioned last night, I think, that I studied a little bit at the Bauhaus. This is the photo that I use all the time, because uh, I think it's a great kind of quirky photo. Um, I always wanted to be an architect when I was younger. Uh, I ended up diverting and going to industrial design school. Uh, but during that period, I actually studied for six months at the Bauhaus in Dessau. And this is me being very hands-on at the Dessau. We were building hand very hands-on projects, and I uh, in this photo was actually doing some sandblasting of some steel columns that were donated to us for our project. Um, so I, I've always felt like design is a very hands-on process. Throughout my career, I've always been very kind of hands-on with the making of, making of things. So to me, you know, human uh, or machines used in the design process are, they're there as a tool, but it's not the, it's not the predominant thing that I use to design. Um, I moved from uh, industrial design student to, uh, to consultant, and then uh, my partner Stefan and I actually founded a company called Vessel. Uh, this is the Candela rechargeable light. Uh, we made a lot of these. Uh, it's a very electronic product. Um, we actually, uh, with Vessel, we actually um, created this company because we had a love for housewares and for, for human touch and human interaction with product. So we felt all of the products that we were working on as design consultants, medical goods, uh, consumer electronics, uh, 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 sporting equipment, they were all very kind of cold and hands-off, and we felt like we needed that, that touch to the, to the final consumer and that, that human quality in the products that we were making. So we founded this company to bring a little bit of that human touch and connection to the end consumer back to the products that we were making. Long story short, because you'll see more of this next week if you're here for our workshop, um, from Vessel, we ended up uh, creating this very successful brand. We sold off that company, and uh, I moved on, uh, both of us actually moved on in our careers to doing some, some different things. Uh, I continued uh, design work. I became a corporate leader uh, for a couple of different companies, including Adidas Group uh, based in Asia, uh, and another company called Targus based in Los Angeles, where I was the head of design and innovation uh, globally for this computer accessories manufacturer. Also very cold, hands-off kind of product. Uh, this is another company I did some consulting work for called Ray, and this was my real kind of first interaction with a, with a smart home kind of device where uh, it was less about the hard good and more about the interface and the connection to all the other the products that it was connected to. So this is a, a smart remote control, uh, which was, a, it's a universal remote that connects all of your entertainment devices in your home and gives you access to live TV, actually, uh, to enable you to search like you would through Netflix or, or Hulu, but for live TV channels. So it was a really brilliant concept uh, that the startup based in New York came up with a few years ago. And so uh, Stefan actually uh, will maybe mention this a little bit, worked on the consumer experience and the customer service side of the company, and I did the industrial design for this, for this device. After all of this, um, uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, there's this kind of coldness, again, of these types of products. And, and I have always had that, as I mentioned, this, this connection to wanting to touch and make and, and and uh, be, uh, I guess, more connected to and, and feel more tactile with the products that I'm designing. So I have always had an interest in apparel as well. So I've designed some of my own apparel, but never had my own brand or anything. But when I was at Targus, I had the opportunity, because it's a computer accessories manufacturer, I had the opportunity to also be involved in the soft goods of the company. They make computer bags and things like that. And I helped rebrand and create some new product lines for the company that uh, were making the company a little bit more youthful and, and trying to uh, attract a different market. Um, <clears throat> After all of this kind of consulting work and corporate work, I have still always felt like I was not pursuing my passion. So I've always enjoyed everything I've done in my career, but there's always been something missing. Uh, even with our, you know, developing our own company, our own products, um, 
I, there was always this urge to do architecture because that's what I wanted to do from when I was 12 years old. And so I've always dabbled a little bit. I've you know, designed some spaces. When we had our company, we had a few retail stores and I designed the interiors of the stores. Uh, this is a house that I designed for us and built uh, in the east coast of, of the US. And um, three years ago, uh, we kind of gave up our life in LA and actually moved to the desert and uh, we renovated the house and, and added on to this house from the 50s. Um, and I really regained this appreciation for architecture and in particular Palm Springs. I don't know if anybody, has anybody been to Palm Springs, California? No? Yes? Um, it is, it's, it's a kind of a hotbed for design in California. Aside from Silicon Valley and Los Angeles and everywhere else, it, it, there's a lot going on in Palm Springs. It was known in the, in the mid 50s as the escape for a lot of Hollywood actors because it was within a certain distance of LA and they could get there. So a lot of design happened in Palm Springs actually. Raymond Lowy had a house there and, and designed uh, his famous Studebaker car in Palm Springs actually. Uh, and a lot of these celebrities had houses that, that um, they, they had famous architects of the time kind of designed for them. So there's this, this history of design that's been preserved in Palm Springs in a really incredible way. So you see the evidence of mid-century and more recently um, with our reintroduction or our introduction of Palm Springs, around the same time, there's been a lot of uh, other creatives moving back there. So it's, it was this kind of, um, this uh, really nice kind of return to architecture and appreciation for the built space that, that made me want to go back and start pursuing my architectural career. So. Uh, short story, I've shifted back to architecture now. So my background, as I mentioned last night, is on the product side, you know, a very kind of consumer good oriented and home good, but now in the environmental side, I'm designing spaces. And what I like about it is that hands-on, one-on-one connection to the consumer, to, to, I have one, instead of now a million consumers, I have one consumer, they have a very specific problem, and I'm solving that problem for them. And I was actually talking to somebody last night about um, the complete opposite, uh, Simo uh, Simone. Uh, he was an architect and has actually moved into product design for the exact same reason that I left product design because I, I felt like I wasn't connecting to the end consumer by designing something that was going to be used by millions or hundreds of thousands of people. I wanted that m very personal connection to, to a consumer. So I'm I, again, thinking, in thinking of this context and human-machine interaction, I'm realizing that I, I'm all about the one-on-one -on -one and the hands-on and the kind of the making side of things. Uh, to talk about you know what we're going to talk about today, uh, and to talk about the good and bad, I want to kind of first kind of talk about what design is. Anybody want to take a stab at defining design for us? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone recently out of school that wants to take a stab at designing design? Uh, this is our definition. We've used it for a long time. It's a plan. So it's not about the aesthetics. It's not about the process. It's it's just a plan for something, right? So if design is a plan, what's good design? Good plan, yes, it's a well-conceived plan, exactly. Yeah, it's very simple, right? What is good design? It's a well-conceived plan. It's a very non-subjective, it's a very objective definition of what is good design. Uh, some of these might be familiar to people. Anybody know Dieter Rams? Germans in the audience know Dieter Rams? Uh, I've always respected Dieter Rams. Uh, he, in the 50s, mid 50s, uh, or maybe late 50s, developed his 10, idea, 10 principles of what good design is. And, I, and I, I really believe all of them. This is not all of them, but it's a kind of a summary of some of them, basically. Um, uh, he said, you know, good design should be basically buildable. You should be, it should be easy to make. Um, it should be affordable. It should be accessible to consumers. Um, it should add value. It should be useful to people, add some kind of value to their lives. Uh, it should be durable in both material and construction, but also in concept so that it, it is long lasting, so that a good design actually is classic and la lasts a long time. Uh, good design is usable, so it actually is ergonomic, it, it functions well, it's intuitive. Um, and uh, finally, aesthetic. So there is an aesthetic element that it should be basically good looking, it should be beautiful. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't, it's not really relevant to people. If it doesn't look good, it's not good design. So it's not, good design is not all about aesthetics in Dieter Ram's um, interpretation. It's, it's about all of these things. Does that make sense? So therefore, what is bad design? <laughs> it's not, so all, all of those things are empathetic to the consumer. That's fundamentally the, the central point, right? Good design is empathetic to the, to the person that's using the product or, or the service or the, the interface. So bad design is not empathetic to the user experience. So in talking about human-machine interaction and how machines are used in the design process, we need to define what a machine is. So anybody stab at machine definition? Somebody, machine? No? Uh, an apparatus that automates or enhances human actions, does that make sense? So it could be as simple as a pen, 
a pen kind of enhances a human act. You cannot write with ink with your finger. So a machine could be, I think, as simple as a pen, uh, all the way up through maybe something that's a little more complex like 3D CAD, right? So in terms of automation, we have the efficiency and consistency that a machine can bring to the process. Um, so there's the efficiency of, of CAD, which is faster than doing something by hand. Uh, in terms of enhancement, there's the speed, there's maybe the reach that a human can't achieve, like really complex computations that it would take us years to do uh, as one individual that a machine can accomplish in minutes. So these, um, this efficiency and automation um, are achievable by a machine. Um, what makes machines different than humans? Um, we say it's thoughts versus actions. So a machine uh, does actions humans think, right? A thought is an idea that's occurring, occurring suddenly in the mind, like a creative spark, uh, that, 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 that um, kind of that little spark of an idea that, that is, is kind of unexplainable where it comes from, right? That is a unique human uh, concept that machines cannot achieve. An action is a dedication of resources to that effort to, to actually execute something. It's to accomplish a tax, task, to kind of take action on the thought that a human has created. So this is the difference between humans and machines. So this is what I think is interesting to explore. You know, in the design and development process, all, all of the, the, these steps that we talked about, uh, starting at research and ideation and iteration and execution, where traditionally humans provide the thinking, the creative thought, the, the critical thinking throughout this process. So at the research and ideation phase, at the very early phase of the design and development process, humans are the drivers, right? We are the thinkers. We provide that creative, uh, critical thinking to the process. So far in AI, we have not seen, I don't think anyway, unless somebody can tell me otherwise, I haven't seen machines being the impetus of a creative, critical thought. Anybody have? Any evidence otherwise yet? We'd like to be there, I think, right? Machines are providing action in the prototyping, testing, maybe some of the evaluation phase, but generally humans are still at that early phase of the process. So machines help communicate, build, and test concepts. We have all kinds of evidence of machines in this process. Every, again, everything from a simple pen, maybe some digital input tools, uh, 3D scanning, 3D CAD, all the way through AI, which is where AI comes into this process, I think in terms of where it's used for helping to analyze, where it's used to find patterns. Um, virtual reality is being used incredibly in, in all various aspects of design for testing and, and, uh, and user, user experience testing. So some examples of uh, a little bit of uh, design and development of a few different products. Um, this is early phase. This is hand sketching. These are things that Actually, these, some of these may have been colored on computer, but so they were using the aid of a computer, but these were done by hand. These thoughts were not created by a machine. Machines are used in this process when you get into 3D modeling and, and being able to quickly, you know, rapidly test something, model something to get consumer feedback, to make it seem a little more real, to confirm design, but not necessarily to create it. So these are you know, 3D models, super quick uh, explorations to, to make something feel a little more real. Uh, and then prototyping also, we're using machines a lot in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, 3D printing has, been, has become so commonplace. This is a product that we did at Vessel um, called the Luau Lantern. And at the time it was, it was um, I believe it was 3D printed and then cast. But um, before this, we would have had to hand carve like a, a clear plastic or mold a clear plastic sheet by hand to create this effect. But with the aid of 3D printing, and this is even 15 years ago, uh, we were able to quickly prototype something and test it in ways that we weren't before. Um, when I started in school, model making was a huge, very tactile, very hands-on uh, skill. And there were model makers, a lot of people probably remember, there were model makers in industrial design firms that their sole task was to be that, that model maker. And they've, a lot of that skill has been taken over by machines. Um, but there's still something about the tactility of working with materials as a designer, I find, of actually making that uh, has been lost by sending something off to print. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the risks of that uh, in a little bit. Even further to 3D, just 3D printing now is uh, generative design or, adapt or, or uh, additive design where uh, machines are now being used to take you know, a, a part that would have been just kind of constructed and, and subtracted from material sheets and, and uh, stock materials where we're now establishing some parameters and then using uh, computer modeling to have it actually generate 
itself what the best solution is. So this is an example of a bracket where the parameters were set for the interior diameter of what was required here and the mounting points, and this was created not designed by an engineer or a designer, but created by a machine to basically establish the minimum amount of material and structure that was required to create what it needed to do based on the stresses of the forces that were, that were applied to this. So machines are almost at the point where they're being used to actually do really, really complex tasks that humans just cannot create. I mean, no human could do the amount of calculation required really to achieve something like this. Is it beautiful? Is it, maybe it is, it's ugly beautiful. Um, is it good design? It's, it's buildable now. Uh, it's buildable because we have the technology to do it, right? We have 3D printing, we have these really complex pr uh, prototyping and mass production techniques to create something like this, which would have been cost prohibitive. So in this case, I think, you know, in, in terms of mach human machine interaction, there's a, still a u there's still a human at the beginning of this. There's still somebody that's setting the parameters. So uh, I throw this question out actually, is, is the human still a designer here? The person that's defining the parameters that this machine is using to generate this, is he or she the designer, or is the, is the computer the designer in this case? Um, and so that is evidence of technology being an enabler. We have these incredibly complex softwares and systems and machines to make uh, and, and design, uh, and technology is enabling this. And with any power like this, we have immense power at our fingertips now as designers and engineers, that with that power comes great responsibility. This is, I think this is from a superhero movie or something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, with, you know, there is that responsibility to know when to use machines for their strengths and when to hold back. I said this last night, restraint is a really important thing, I think, in our industry today. This is an example of um, uh, adapt or, uh, uh, additive or generative design being maybe used in not so good a way. Um, this is not a comment on whether this is good or bad or ugly. It's just the fact that there's a sole, a shoe sole here that's being used possibly more as a marketing thing, possibly, than a real problem-solving thing. This looks great, it's very photographable, it's very uh, photogenic, but is it good design? Anybody, anybody want to comment on whether this is good or bad or ugly, beautiful? Somebody, Every, we all have opinions. How much does it affect the functionality? If it improves the functionality, right? So we don't know, but presumably it, I mean, that's how they're marketing it, presumably, yeah. Uh, in architecture, I mean, we're seeing evidence of 3D, 3D modeling creating buildings that were never achievable before, right? These complex shapes and just crazy forms that are, you know, they're impressive, they're really spectacular. Are they necessary? These are pretty excessive. Um, you know, some of the, the requirements on the structure to create these things is, is immense, and it's so much more expensive and, and intense to create these things than it, than it was before, to create very simple buildings. So, you know, again, they're, they're beautiful. Um, these maybe border on, on art rather than design, possibly, because they're such, you know, uh, spectacles uh, that we've created. Again, is it good design? It, they're beautiful, but is it good design? And have machines and technology enabled something that, uh, that's maybe a little bit grotesque now? There's, I love uh, looking at cars, for example, of, uh, of design process and evolution and, and where we are technologically. Uh, this is a concept, uh, the uh, I-8 uh, concept sketch, one of the early ones. Um, and there's something beautiful about this, the purity of a concept sketch, that hand quality where, you know, you're, the, again, the human side of this is creating something that is, a, it's a pure idea. It's, you can see the, the concept. It's very simple and, and, and elegant. When it's taken to extreme, once you move into using machines for the process, there's a risk that things get over-designed. They are kind of, the machines are exploited and you maybe add details and, and complex shapes that are only now possible because of the human-machine interaction, but are they necessary? Were they, you know, should this have been allowed to go this far with the, the complexity of the form? Uh, going back, again, beautiful, simple, elegant, maybe a little bit overdone, maybe a few too many details thrown in because they could, right? So just because they could, they did, but should they have? Uh, some older, older references of cars. Um, again, back to the idea of restraint, there's this a, a beauty, again, in the simplicity of the line work and, and not just the hand, the, the tactility of the sketch, but the simplicity of the form overall. 
um, because they had limitations in manufacturing, limitations in drawing, and limitations in prototyping. Uh, another example, uh, being here in Italy, we had to show a Ferrari, uh, uh, just the beauty of figuring out some of these surface details and, and, and the design elements that were, you know, they could have been taken further if they had access to 3D modeling at the time, probably. If manufacturing was a little more, you know, they had more complex manufacturing techniques, this would have been a very different car. So uh, the, the, the requirement on the designer and the restraints of being able to sketch this by hand or carve a chunk of, of clay gave them some restraints that they had to work within. They had to figure out these details in their heads or with a little doodle before going into production with them. And I think that's the, that's the missing link or that's the, the leap that people, that designers are taking when now they have access to, to uh, really complex uh, uh, CAD techniques that they're, they're now in, uh, enabled to do these really complex things and don't have to think about the refinement and the restraint up front. There is a right place and a right time for, for the integration of machines in the process, and, and for, uh, especially when you uh, understand the restraint. So this is a great example of um, the opportunity for mass customization, right? This is, a, this is still a concept, I believe, but um, the, the ability to mass customize, meaning every production piece is unique to the user in this case, where it's adjusted to their uh, anatomy, is it's a huge opportunity, and this is only achievable, really, and cost effective with uh, integration of machines in the process. So maybe a good, uh, an example of good design, it's beautiful, but uh, maybe an example of a good use of machines in the process. Another example of, I guess, mass customization, web, on, on the website of things, uh, Squarespace and a few other examples of this have taken web design, I think, to uh, an extreme mass customization where you have a plethora of templates that you use has this commoditized web design? So again, the use of machines, the use of, of uh, the efficiency of machines in this case uh, has pushed web design maybe to, uh, to, a, to a commodity and to uh, being not empathetic to the consumer. Because this is now not addressing a specific user or user groups or brands needs. You're giving access uh, to everyone to basically create a website in five minutes from your phone possibly. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's kind of homogeneity. It's, it's, you know, so many websites now look the same because of access to templates like this. So it's not really necessarily empathetic. We've sidestepped the whole design process by giving everybody access via machines to, uh, to all of these templates. We're seeing examples of rebranding also. The, the evidence of sidestepping the design process and the lack of uh, that initial thought or evidence of a, of a human touch in logo design. So a lot of rebranding, I think I've selected all American companies, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Gap's old logo, um, classic, you know, it, it's, a, it's a unique font, uh, it's a little specific to them. The rebrand is generic, it's a standard font, it's, it feels like, again, it's done by a computer and it missed any evidence of human interaction or an initial thumbnail sketch or something, where did this come from? No judgment, I'm not saying it's ugly or bad, well, but I am. Uh, craft also, you know, not to say that this is good or bad either, but there's evidence there of a concept. It's, it's a little more unique, and it's gone to this homogenous, this, this could be anything now. Seattle's Best Coffee, which I don't like their coffee, but at least the original logo had some character, and again, it's gone to, this could be a gas station or, you know, anything else. And it's, I mean, there, there are so many, so many uh, examples of this online. So many companies are rebranding, and there's a, there's a lack of that initial kind of concept, I think. Airbnb may be a better example of a rebrand, where both are fun, both are, are interesting, but the rebrand, at least there's a bit of a concept there. There's an evidence of, you could see that maybe this was a doodle on a, on a napkin at one point, right? There's, there's a bit of a human touch in it, and it makes more sense, and it's not a generic use of a, of a font for, for a company. So, that, you know, back to the, the idea of a sketch, a human kind of touch, there is emotion. This is a Frank Gehry sketch for the Walt Disney Concert Hall. There's an emotion in this sketch, and there's a sense of tactility, and you engage with it, and, you know, you feel something about this sketch, right? Um, does anybody not feel anything about this sketch? Everybody has a reaction to it. You might think it's ugly, but there, there's something there. As soon as you go into 3D modeling, you lose that. And I, so, back to machines communicating, helping communicate and, and evaluate designs. In this case, the, you know, the three models used to build and, and uh, kind of capture the concept, but that initial concept in the sketch is really critical. It's a really critical part of the process. 
And I'm seeing evidence more and more of designers. I, I used to teach in Los Angeles, and I would see design students not even sketch on paper. They immediately, they have an idea in their head, and they immediately go into building a 3D model. And you lose so much of the actual design process of that critical thought of the, of the, the connection to a consumer when you jump into, into using a tool that is giving you ultimate freedom. Because there isn't the initial thought that is, that is captured and refined and, and iterated a little bit before you get into 3D modeling. So that leap from this to this is critical. There's still a lot of refinement that can happen with hand sketching, with that, that kind of tactility and, and resolving things as we do as designers with, uh, with a lot of thought and, and creativity before limiting ourselves or giving, a, giving ourselves no restraint with the uh, aid of 3D modeling. The final building is impressive. Uh, again, whether it's good or bad or ugly is a little subjective. This, you know, it, there's emotion here, and I think that initial little sketch that he did captures that emotion, and you, you feel it when you're next to the building. It's, there, there's, it's an impressive building, um, but I think the 3D modeling, if you jump, again, if you jump into it too quickly, you lose some of the restraint. This is, it's certainly not restrained as a building, but, uh, but it does convey, you know, what happens inside the building. It's an emotional building for sure. But, you know, th this is not the same building, but another Frank Gehry building, the structure that's required on the inside to create these amazing emotional you know, structures is, it's, it's crazy. It's so uncost effective. Um, you have to question whether that, that uh, investment is worth it. Is this, is this just gratuitous and, and unnecessary? What's been enabled by 3D modeling, especially within architecture, uh, has pushed you know, the, the inside of the building to a point where it, uh, yeah, I, I really do question the, the, whether this is good design or not because it is somewhat not buildable because of the complexity of the structure. It is certainly not cost effective, so it's not accessible to a lot of people. So I, I myself kind of consider this bad design, following our own rules of what is, what is good and bad. It's not empathetic to, to the builder, to the user. You know, some of the rooms in these buildings are just crazy shapes that are difficult to furnish. So it is kind of questionable whether it's good or bad, right? Um, another example of a, this is an Edmonton art gallery, which there's a tactility. This is a handmade model. And you know, there is a nice tactility to this. And you can see somebody kind of sitting there and manipulating forms and materials to create a shape that maybe was a little easier to do actually in, in a handmade model than in, a, in 3D uh, it, or than sketching it. You could actually create a shape and, and kind of communicate a design intent. Uh, but when it's taken to the final execution, it, it's almost like they leapt from this tactility and a simplicity of the forms in the 3D handmade model into this mess of a building which um, the, the, again, the excess and the, the lack of restraint in using the, using the machine tools uh, enabled them to uh, create a kind of a chaos. Um, there's, it's, it's confusing, there's too many materials, there's forms that are not resolved well, intersections that are not resolved well. So, well. so I, I think there's a, yeah, there's a leap there, again, with the lack of restraint. Another building that looks like it was designed by 3D CAD, right? This looks like it was done, you know, leapt into 3D modeling right away. It's super uh, skeletal and doesn't look like this could have been created other than with 3D CAD, right? This is the original sketch for it. So this is uh, Calatrava. Uh, his original concept, this is the New World Trade Center uh, transportation hub in New York City. Um, and it's, the, it's these hands that are, that are opening up to the heavens. And it's just such a beautiful gesture. And the, another of his sketches, it's, it's almost amateurish, but there's a simplicity of the concept, there's evidence of that concept. When you go back to the building, it communicates through to the end. In this case, possibly 3D modeling in the machine, he used in the appropriate way to execute and maybe make his concept even better. But the original concept evidence is still there. There's evidence, of, I think, that human touch and, and, and a simple concept that gets communicated through the end. Another example, no 3D CAD, it's iconic, it's impressive, it's precise, no 3D CAD necessary here. The concept is very clear, uh, right? I threw it in just for fun. Uh, this, for uh, people here, might be a little more fam familiar, the Sergato Famiglia, uh, no 3D CAD required here. It's quite complex, bordering on the grotesque maybe, almost like a Gary building. I, you know, I wonder whether this is, uh, is good design or not. It is. You know, it's not necessarily empathetic to the builder or the user. It's still not finished, uh, so it's not necessarily buildable. Um, it is incredibly expensive. 
but it is, it is maybe more art than design. So it's another kind of interesting discussion is when, you know, when we're creating, are we creating something that is art or are we creating something that's truly design? Um, another example of maybe pushing tools and, and doing things that are unnecessary, uh, Dyson, Dyson vacuums uh, are known for being bright and colorful and very, very exposed. And their, their brand statement really, or, or what uh, Dyson says about his design uh, team is that they, that they expose the, the functioning elements of the products. They, you know, they celebrate the function and highlight the, the pieces that are doing, some, doing the work. Um, but is, is this design taken to an extreme, again, enabled by machines, um, because we can do this, uh, is this more of a marketing message than anything else? Is this good design? It's, you know, it's certainly a statement, but it is, it's it incredibly overbuilt for a vacuum cleaner. Um, and, uh, and it really, it, it stands out in a, in a house. Uh, and I, you know, culturally, I think it's different everywhere, but, uh, but as, a, as a, you just look at the individual piece as a, as a piece of design and question whether it's, it's good or not, it's, I think it's questionable. And again, this would not have been possible uh, without the aid of, of complex 3D software to really resolve some of these things um, that you couldn't have done uh, via hand sketching. Lego, I loved, this is not mine, but I loved Lego when I was a kid. It was my introduction to architecture, actually. I built amazing little houses and, and then drew them. Um, and the restraint that was required because of the limited number of pieces, right? You got a Lego set and you had four or five shapes of sizes of blocks and a few colors and and it, it opened up creativity. It, it forced you to explore with this limited palette, but it, you, you created your own sets and, and games and buildings. Now this is Lego. Lego is taken to an extreme where there's so much, because it can be done, um, there's so much variety. It's just, it's chaos. It's turned into these very defined sets and it's actually limiting kids' creativity, I think, because you're given all of these tools. You have slides and you have all of these elements that do very specific things it's just, it's opened up, it's opened up chaos and, and uh, I think it's limiting creativity now. So it's an interesting, I think, reflection of what's happening on the design side as well with us with access to all these tools. All of a sudden we, have, we can do anything we want almost with any of these tools that we have, um, but it's leading to, to chaos. Uh, back to Braun, uh, an example of Dieter Ram's design. Just so beautiful, it's simplicity, it's restraint. Um, it's classic, this could have been designed you know, uh, this year by Apple, for example. Uh, we know that Jonathan Ives uh, evidently references uh, Braun a lot. Um, and uh, I, again, there's this classicness in the form, but it came from a restraint. It came from not, uh, no access to 3D modeling. It came from restrictions of manufacturing, um, but he embraced it and, and I, I think following his rules for good design, this is accessible, it's buildable, it's, uh, it has that longevity um, and it solves problems for, for consumers in a really beautiful way. And then to the extreme, this never possible 10 years, 10, 20 years ago, never possible. So there's, um, it's not just the technology inside that's made this possible. There, there are, you know, the, the, the refinement and the, the finite elements of 3D modeling have enabled this as well. Uh, in this case, there is restraint. I think this could have been taken over the top because of the, the ability to do you know, an incredibly complex shapes and structures. The simplicity of this, I think, is a great example. So whether we talk about the phone as a good thing or not, the, you know, the, the interface and the, the applications that we have on the phone are a different thing. But the product itself, when you just look at the industrial design of this, I think there's incredible restraint in the minimal surfaces and the, the level of detail. Only possible with 3D modeling software, but uh, but I think there's still evidence of some original thought and some refinement in understanding the complexities of some of these little tiny details and how those surfaces, you could use a microscope and look at some of these surfaces and the inter intersections and they're just really, really well refined. Uh, so I think a great example of the idea of restraint um, in the design process and using machines in the right, uh, right time in the process as well. So um, the tool must suit the idea not the reverse. So when you're, uh, when you're thinking about all the tools that we have access to, again, rather than jumping into 3D CAD right away, like a lot of my students did, the idea of, of sketching by hand, of, of that, you know, refining, uh, capturing that initial concept, as we do as designers, uh, tactile, 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 
um, is really important. And then, you, and then you, you find the tools to help communicate that design rather than the reverse where you're using the tools first and then figuring out the design along the way. Back to another sketch, uh, another uh, Gary's sketches. So much emotion in this. I'm gonna quickly go through some examples within the architecture world to, sh to kind of discuss you know, this, this idea of the right tool in the right time. This on computer, no way. Well, he may have used a stylus on an iPad, but, uh, and that's how I sketch now actually. Uh, so it is using a machine, but there is still evidence of human touch and human thought because it's, 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 uh, it's, it's pen to paper, it's, it's mind to, to hand to, to paper as opposed to translating it through a, through a machine. Another hand sketch by Tadeo Ando of these buildings uh, in Japan, um, the, the, the softness and the, the, the uh, emotion that's captured in still rigid buildings, but there's, there's, a, there's something engaging about this that's used at the right time in the process, early on in the process. Even little mod preliminary models, massing models, these quick little thumbnails. Uh, we were at lunch yesterday with Jamshid and talking about Google Glass, the first model of Google Glasses being a piece of cardboard that was cut from a pizza box. There's something, again, about that initial, you know, working with materials uh, to figure something out quickly by hand that is, that's amazing, and you, you can't capture that in a machine uh, very quickly. Another hand sketch, figuring out floor plans uh, early on in the process. Another hand sketch, figuring out elevations. The idea of perspective sketching seems to be lost on a lot of younger designers these days. Um, and, and then uh, using inter interesting materials to communicate design intent. That again, 3D modeling, as soon as you take a building into 3D CAD, you're applying the actual materials usually to, to the surfaces and you get a realistic rendering. Some of the emotion of a model like this that can only be made by hand using alternative materials is lost when you, when you jump into 3D CAD. So this is the right place and time to be using you know, more hand, uh, hand done uh, techniques. Maybe with the aid of machines, but not only with machines. You jump into, into more refined CAD, of course, this is where you're figuring out more complex shapes. This is the appropriate time, right, where we can bring efficiency um, and, uh, and maybe stretch ourselves where we can't be doing some of these complex calculations and things um, without the aid of machines. You know, we're using here uh, machines to confirm a design. This is a rendering that was done to communicate to a client. Um, and uh, this is more difficult to communicate in context an actual rendering of a, of a shot to get the client to sign off on this before we move into the final, uh, final CAD to build it. Um, again, not, uh, not achievable prior to being able to use machines, but there's a right place and right time to do this. The thinking is still there ahead of time. Even taken to an extreme, that initial Tadeo Ando sketch, this is a 3D rendering that was done, believe it or not, uh, of these buildings uh, to confirm design before it was actually built. Um, you see the final, I don't have the final photo, but you see the final photo of this. There are power lines, there are trees around here. The rendering was done to make it feel like it's really in situ, but uh, this is fake water. It is all, it's all uh, false, but it really does communicate a design. It's again, the right time and place, I think here, to communicate the final design. This is not the original concept sketch. There's evidence of original thought there, um, but it's beautiful in its purity and simplicity, and that's what Today, Oan is great at is capturing a really pure initial thought and then communicating it through um, through the right tool at the right time down the road. Summarize: um, machines give us freedom. We must use restraint. Um, innovation always lies in a good design process. If you follow that process, you start off with that human touch, the the, the human tool at the beginning. You'll always you'll always follow a good design process. Good design requires a balance of thought and action. So again, using the right tool for the right place and time. I think integrating machines and, and, and interacting with machines in the right, right, right way at the right time uh, is a good balance of thought and action. I'm really interested to see how machines can help even more, as I showed with that example of the bracket, how machines can help um, with some of the critical thinking, but not take it over completely. And a tool must suit the idea, not the reverse. Always. Uh, seems simple, but uh, use the right tool, but have the idea first. That's it. Questions? Thank you.